There are many anime series with side movies that have little or no relevance to the actual story or plot, but exist purely to provide another chance for a story with the same characters within the same world and setting, such as Inuyasha, Fairy Tale, Bleach, etc. There are also many anime out there that have a continuation movie that ties up the loose ends left over by the main series. Think Full Metal Alchemist, Conqueror of Shambhala, Madoka Magica Rebellion, or the Psychopaths movie. But this is the first time I've ever come across an anime movie being used as a seasonal bridge. Welcome one and all, I am Coriander Stone, and today, a review of the 2014 movie from studios Gora and Gohan, K Missing Kings. Now, as I mentioned earlier, K Missing Kings is in no way a standalone movie. It serves as the bridge between the two seasons of K Project, that is to say, the original season, K Project, and the second season, which aired in 2015, K Return of Kings. Let me say from the start that I think K Missing Kings was just a really great idea on the studio's part. They knew they had to cover some ground to get the story from the point where it left off at the end of K Project episode 13 to the point where they wanted to pick up for the second season. And they had a couple of options in doing that. One was to try and cram the entirety of Missing Kings into the first couple of episodes of Return of Kings, shorten the plot of Return of Kings, and then implement a few month time gap mid-season to separate out the two parts. A second option was that they could have made Missing Kings into its own second season with Return of Kings as a third and following season. Both of these slightly more conventional options, however, come with serious flaws. The first would A, rush the story of Return of Kings, which they had a full 13 episode count's worth of plot for, and B, probably mean shortening the plot of Missing Kings from its hour and some odd running time down to one, maybe two episodes, which in turn would have meant that they would have had to scrap a lot of the movie's complexity and development in favor of a shorter running time. The second option would have come with the opposite problem, because while as enjoyable and in-depth as K. and Kings was, there was really only an hour and thirteen odd minutes to be got out of it. That really only translates to about three, maybe four episodes of material. To take up an entire 12 or 13 episode season, they would have had to stretch out the plot beyond all recognizability, and while they might have been able to add some of the stuff in some of the side bongas to stretch it out a little bit more, the entire focus would have been off, and there just wouldn't have been enough material so that the season would have been incredibly forced and would honestly have dropped the quality of the entire show rather than building up hype for the third, or rather, in actuality, second season as it currently does. By creating Missing Kings as an individual unit, a movie, the writers gained the ability to control the spread of time and thus pace the events at a speed that worked for the story rather than what fit the time slot. In terms of plot and characters, what you have to understand is that K Missing Kings is the moment when K as a whole goes from a protagonist focused anime with many strong characters to get screen time to a completely unbiased point of view showing the story of many people including our protagonist. Nor is this subtly done as Yashiro is conspicuous throughout the movie mainly by his absence. His time on screen is made up entirely of five or so minutes at the very end of the movie, which isn't even directly connected to any of the movie's events, but rather takes place in a cutaway to him in another location. Not only that, but there are dead characters who actually receive more time than our quite living protagonist. Nor is Yashiro the only character shoved aside. Both Blue King Reishi Munakata and Fushimi, who were featured in the initial season, are similarly treated. Both they and Scepter 4 as a whole only appear occasionally throughout the movie, and when they do, it is not for long. So if those are all the characters who don't get screen time, then who does? Well, part of the story follows the other two leads from the initial season, who still receive their toll of screen time, Kuro Yatagami and Neko, as they search for the missing Yashiro before becoming entangled in the main plot of the show. 
The main plot, however, revolves around Homura. We learn that after the end of the initial season, the Red Clan Homura was basically scattered and disbanded. Only a few members remain, and even they aren't doing much of anything. However, now, what little remains of Homura is faced with a new threat. That threat is the fifth and green clan, Jungle, who appear to be the show's new villains. They are led from behind the scenes by a mysterious king, Nagare Hisui, who appears only in the form of his voice projected by a talking bird. Yes, you can actually take that scene seriously, I promise. The face of Jungle, therefore, is represented by another, one of Jungle's leading clansmen, Yukari Mishakuji. While clearly the movie's villain, Yukari is also an incredibly well-written and well-rounded character. For one thing, he has a past relating to that of Kuro, and their shared past becomes the main focus of a lot of their part of the story. For another, a lot of the lines that come out of Yukari's mouth, especially during his fights with Kuro, are the sort you would expect to hear from the hero. Lines about the power of friendship, courage, loyalty, and trust aren't exactly that new. See every fairy tale episode ever. But it was surprising to hear them used not in mockery but in earnest from the mouth of the movie's villain. And that's a lot of what made Yukari stand out to me. Well, that and the badass fighting animation, of course. The basic premise of the movie is that Jungle is out to capture Anna, child clansman of the now defunct Homura. They seek to use her special abilities as a strain, her finding and tracking abilities, to locate Yashiro, who they see as their biggest threat. The majority of the movie follows their attempt to capture Anna, who is defended by Rikio, a formerly almost invisible character from the sidelines of season one, who now becomes far more relevant, as well as the attempts of Kuro and Neko to aid him in this attempt. The story also documents Yata, another Homura remnant and season one major character, and his desperate attempts to help Anna once he finally understands what's going on. But the thing that really makes K Missing Kings isn't the high stakes of protecting Anna, the new viewpoint of the show, the development given to Kuro and Yata, and even Yukari is pushed to the side when it comes to what really makes this movie so spectacular and that is Anna herself. I won't dare go into details for fear of spoiling the best part of the movie, but what I will say is that when it comes down to it, K Missing Kings is, at its heart, Anna's development arc, and boy is it good. In season one, Anna was kind of a walking question mark. She was this Rosen Maiden doll looking kid hanging around in this super violent gang. Oh, I'm not saying Anna wasn't useful. She was. Her powers to track and locate people made her a valuable member of Homura. But that still didn't really answer why she was there from the point of view of the writers. Many people thought that Anna just existed to act as the show's lolly. And to those people, I say... <laughs> And boy, does Missing Kings prove it. Anna's character development over the course of the movie makes her by far one of the strongest characters K-Project has. And in an anime based on character and character development, that's actually saying a lot. In terms of animation, the visuals and action for K-Missing Kings are some of the most beautiful I've ever seen. From the very first images of Munakata's Sword of Damocles onward, the animation just sucks you back into the K-Project universe, creating in me a sort of sense of nostalgia for the show that I didn't even know I felt. Honestly, the level of quality, while superb, is exactly what could be expected, because the animation for the original show is already gorgeous, and then bringing to it the sort of budget one has for a feature film could only help to improve it. The soundtrack was again quite good, with special highlights being a song sung by Anna's voice actor, which appears at the moment of her greatest character development, and the ending song, which is once again performed by the band Angela. Taking all this into account, I cannot fail to give K Missing Kings the same rating I gave the original K Project show, that is to say, 5 out of 5 stars, for a perfectly well done continuation, and well thought out, well planned, well executed, beautiful to watch, intriguing, enjoyable, and if its main purpose was in fact just to get you hyped for season 2, 
Boy, did it work. Now then, I can't exactly give alternate anime recommendations for a continuation movie, so this is Coriander Stone, and I thank you for watching. <laughs>